Hi, welcome to our general interest seminar. I'm Isaac. Um, today I'm going to deliver the introduction to Linux and Shell actually based in shark environment. So some of the explanation only available for shark net. But most of topics actually are very general and broad. So I'm sure this uh, general interest seminar will give you a brief idea what is the Linux, what is the different uh, aspects from the Windows or Macintosh operating system. So you may have at least some idea how to access to the Linux machines or clusters, which are usually uh, supported by some uh, supercomputing facilities like us. So basically speaking, I'm going to present some introduction to what is Linux, why we need to use Linux, and which Linux I need to use. And I'll briefly go over our, uh, our latest uh, cluster we got named Graham. And I'll try to explain what's the feature you may expect physically in computing uh, uh, resource. And thirdly, I'll present about some basics about the Linux. So how to log in, how to access your file, how to change your permission, how to list up, how to edit, how to uh, make sure your environment, all the things, because Linux operating system, especially command in uh, line situation, could be quite different from what your daily uh, practice using more Windows machines or Macintosh machines. So I will try to give you basic command in line kind of approach using the terminal. And then I'll explain basic command as well. And if time permitted, I'm hoping to move on to the shell programming a little bit. So I'll briefly explain what's the shell, how to use the kind of command in line programming, which is a shell programming in Linux systems. And I'll briefly show you what's the pipe, uh, what's the for loop, what's the conditional kind of sent, uh, statement uh, in the command line um, environment. So what is Linux? Um, Linux can be seen as a mini Unix. Um, not many people in these days quite know about the Unix machines, but you know, 20 years ago, or at least up to 1990s, uh, Unix machine was very, uh, were very popular in many many different fields, such as um, research, finance, and even uh, visualization, and many many computing power, many many. Uh, computational uh, facilities, they used the Unix machines. At the time, each vendor like IBM, HP, or some microsystems, those kind of uh, uh, manufacturer, actually, they have their own Unix versions operating system. And they actually use that operating system for their system only specific. However, Linux is kind of different. Um, spin-off from the Unix system. Therefore, Linux actually targeting to be uh, compatible with any types of computing system. So Linux is actually originated and developed for uh, free uh, open usage. Therefore, they targeted to be, one more time, installed or implemented in any other system. So f a famous uh, uh, Professor Andrew Tannebaum actually developed Minix, and that's developed into the uh, you know, Linux later on. And Linux Tobald, which is also a famous MIT professor, actually developed the kernel, which is the core thing of the Linux operating system, and then name actually named at the time as a Linux and go on until now. So I am. Um, I only put a very kind of old, 10 years ago kind of data there. But as you can see, there are explosively increasing uh, number of users in these days. And most of the top 500 supercomputers right now actually running Linux as well. So in brief, Linux is one of the operating system mostly targeted for the supercomputing or high performance computing environment. 
And why Unix? Uh, we need to uh, use Linux instead of Unix. In these days, Unix operating system is not that popular anymore because uh, many different uh, shortcomings of the Unix operating system right now. It's very expensive to maintain. It's not very compatible with many different types of third-party software and, you know, a very limited kind of support groups, all the things. Therefore, in these days, even all major vendors like IBM, HP, and every every major vendor is actually using Linux because Linux actually supports a fully networked 64-bit Unix-like operating system. So Linux is pretty much like uh, Unix. Why then we need to use it, Unix? Because Unix is very stable and Unix has many um, Natural features. Unix has um, fairly good um, handling with um, many many users, uh, different from the Windows systems. In these days, Microsoft Windows system also has their own version for the enterprise and and their own uh, specific kind of uh, targeted kind of operating system for this kind of supercomputing facility. However. As I mentioned, more than 95% of supercomputer in these in this world actually running on Linux instead of Windows systems. So Linux actually has most of features of Unix, which is a fully networked 64-bit Unix-like operating system, excellent system stability, and Unix tools and compilers, because because everyone you know, connecting to the Unix machines has their own kind of purpose to compile or run their job there. Therefore, you know, that system must support many different types of computer languages and some libraries and, and what is it, um, binary files as well. And also it has a strong network tools and support to like connect to the other systems, uh, you know, combining some um, protocols for certain um, message passing, those kind of things. And also it supports multi-user, multi-tasking, multi-processor, MPI, those kind of things. Um, and it also supports X Windows GUI and multiple platform, which means it doesn't actually discriminate uh, the hardware types. So it may run on the AMD, it may run on the Intel machines, uh, different kind of different configurations of computer hardware. It doesn't really matter for the Linux to run on. And it also has a plentiful software because Linux system itself is basically free. Therefore, a lot of developers actually develop their software based on this Linux. And also, this software is open source. Therefore, any developer can take a look at the source code of the operating system and make some you know, interesting feature based on those kind of free um, accessible uh, accessibility. Um, yeah, as I wrote it down at the end, the most important reason is Linux is free. That's a really big reason to use Linux. Uh, then which Linux I need to use? We call this one as a distribution because Linux is a kind of big title for a certain type of operating system. And under that Linux umbrella, we have many different types of distribution. Mainly, this distribution actually categorized into two different streams. One is for the end user or desktop user kind of Linux operating system. The other line most likely for enterprise or supercomputing or massively cluster kind of environment as well. So today I will try to explain uh, how to use uh, the enterprise side or supercomputing side of Linux systems more, um, uh, more detail. But definitely, Linux is also available for the end user, which means any desktop user like me, you can install your Linux software operating system on your PC and you can run it on your computer. And there are many different types of uh, Linux distributions available in these days. Uh, Red Hat, the famous Red Hat, and Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, SUSE, and Mint, I mean, there are so many, Gen2, there are so many different types of distribution. However, as I mentioned, 
even though each distribution has their own feature, has a slightly different kind of aspects as well, but the kernel itself, the core thing, is actually updated together by the community of Linux. So it's kind of shared by in all the distributions. So Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, Red Hat, Gen2, all the things has the same core feature. And then each company like uh, Red Hat, uh, Debian, Ubuntu, they actually added their own feature on it. And then they are selling out uh, with some cost as well. So Linux itself is basically free, but if somebody gonna add some features on it, they have a, they are kind of entitled to sell their kind of packages on top of those kind of kernel. Uh, for your information, Ubuntu has been very popular for the uh, general user. Uh, Debian has been very popular as well for a little bit, you know, skillful kind of users. But in these days, Gen2 or uh, Mint uh, Linux is, are also very, very popular too. Uh, for the Sharknet, we actually using CentOS as a fourth kind of line there. CentOS uh, Linux distribution we've been using for our systems in these days. So if you want to have exactly the same operating system in your computer, then you may want to use CentOS. However, Linux is the operating system will be installed by compilation on individual hardware. Therefore, even though you use the same kernel and same version of CentOS with us into your computer, I mean, your computer has a slightly, I'm sure, slightly or quite different uh, hardware features. Therefore, they may have different aspects as well. So basically, name is the same, but the content should be different. Okay, so let me focus on our system a little bit more because most of the uh, audience, I'm sure, you guys are quite used to this Graham system we got recently. It should open last July. Graham has more than 30,000 CPU cores and we have more than 300 GPU. Uh, interconnector means connecting physical node each other. So, because we have more than um, a thousand physical nodes we have, as you see in the CPU nodes, there are 800 nodes and 52, 56 nodes and 24 nodes. And also in GPU nodes, we have 160 nodes as well. So if you add it up, um, and then we need to connect those kind of thousand C, uh, physical nodes uh, more uh, with a more faster kind of connection. So we call that as interconnector. And Graham uh, has um, a 2.6 petaflops of peak theoretical computing performance, which is less than top 50 in top 500 supercomputer list. This is very meaningful because uh, Canada didn't have any machine, you know, recently within top 500. Long time ago, Sinan had it, but this, um, recently they lost their position there. But again, Graham now gets their position less than top 50 in top 500 supercomputer list, which means it's a very powerful, very uh, strong uh, computing uh, resource here. And um, it has more than uh, it has almost 150 terabyte memory. And cooling is a very, very big issue for this kind of physical node because when CPU runs, it generates a lot of heat. So we need to deal with those kind of heat properly. Uh, in Graham, we're using liquid cooling system. So if you look at the picture carefully, uh, the above the rack, there's a yellow lines going through, right? And then uh, there are some water pipes actually connected to the, uh, each rack. So each rack actually cool down through the cold water there. Um, we have lots of cloud computing stack as well. Storage-wise, we have home directory. I'm going to come back to this one later within the system, though. Uh, Graham system has a slightly different feature than our legacy system like Orta or other systems. It has a home scratch project kind of uh, file system. I'm going to explain this one later. Uh, but good thing is uh, 
the size is really big. I mean, it's way bigger than our legacy system, so you don't need to actually worry about too much about the uh, uh, storage quota. And also, um, Graham is one of the um, national platform, uh, so, which means in Compute Canada we have four different sites, and then they are shared by um, the National Data Science Infrastructure. We share all the data, all the things. And this is very important. Um, I'm going to explain this one later, but Linux system, it has all its own file system. So file system is, in a plain language, is a folder kind of structure in a Windows systems. So what is the kind of, um, what kind of folder is under certain folder, or what kind of directory is under certain directory, those kind of way. However, file system, when we're talking about, that is actually, um, when you log in to the system, there are big kind of chunk separation, home, scratch, project. So home is the kind of the directory you will get to when, once you log in. And then scratch is the another chunk of the storage you have to move to the scratch to run your code or something. And there is also another chunk as a project, which is another name. And then you may move your file there and do your job there as well. And then quota means what's the limitation of the file size or what's the limitation of the total amount of the storage. And backup, uh, is it backed up regularly or not? A purge it, which means if certain day actually expired, the system admin is going to erase it or not, and default means is it automatically, you know, useful, uh, uh, sorry, automatically available or not, and mounted on CC. Uh, mounted means it's connected in a, a Linux environment, we say. Mounted means um, you actually put something on it, right? So mounted on CC means is Compute, Compute, Compute Canada, uh, they are really uh, mounted together? Yes. So as you see, each chunk of the file system has their own quota. So home is only 50 gig, scratch 20 terabyte, those kind of way you can see that. And also number of files are also important measure. You have to make sure have a, a, a reasonable amount of a file size and capacity you need to keep on. Software, you know, as I mentioned, we're using CentOS 7 right now, and computer languages, every kinds of, you know, compilable language is available in Graham as well. Um, I may come back to this kind of uh, slide later. Um, this is basically procedure you, when you use the Sharknet systems. You may actually, in the client PC here, and then you may want to move your file okay, to Sharknet, or you want to log on once you move up your file to the Sharknet system. You have to use sh secure shell connection. I'm going to explain this one later. But secu secure shell connection is the only the way you can connect to the Sharknet systems. So let's say you connect it to the Graham and uh, ComputeCanada.ca. We call that a login mode. So you are in the login node, and then you do your job, like a change your parameter in your input file, you compile it, you actually change something in your code, and then compile it, or sometimes debug it, and then you're going to submit your job, and then that submission okay, will go through the Slurm, the scheduler. So Slurm is a scheduler, we call. This is kind of software. Slurm is a software. Is it controlling and handling all the requests from the users. So Slurm will accept all the kind of all the requests from the users and they will decide okay what is the right fit for the each job. So someone asked the Slurm to make uh, some room for like a 32 CPU with like a 10 gigabyte of memory, right? Something like those kind of requests will be compiled properly in the Slurm system, and the Slurm system will try to accommodate that job into allocated node. So at the time, each job will be passed on the computing node, and the computing node 
your job actually running on. And then that computing node, most likely mounted with a scratch or project, and then all the results you calculated from the computing node will be written into the scratch. So this is a pretty much like a procedure you may experience in our cluster-like system uh, environment. So when, it, when you do this one, maybe your client PC is simply Windows systems or Macintosh or Linux even. However, once you log on to the Sharkling machine, every feature after this line, after login node, are actually done in the Linux. So that's why you should know how to play around in the login node, which means moving your files or change your directory or make sure what you have by listing of your files. And sometimes you need to uh, compile, setting up some compilation um, options, all the things. And then you have to submit it. Most of the case, you're not going to access to this kind of computing node and see something. You, I don't think so. But most of the job will be done is this login node. And this login node is definitely, definitely Linux. So that's why I'm, sh I'm hoping this presentation will help you to understand better about the feature in our login node. You don't need to install any Linux operating system in your computer. If you need it, you can simply log in to our system, one of the system, and you can surf around there too. How to log in and log out in a desktop, as I mentioned, there are two different streams. So this is the way you, once you install your, uh, your own Linux operating system in your desktop PC, and then you may have this kind of a login kind of a screen. It's pretty much like any Windows or Macintosh computer. So you may have this kind of desktop kind of a GUI. However, if you want to use uh, the Linux system in our Sharknet system, which means you have to connect to our server. Server and you, your computer should be as a client. And then the client and server must be connected using the secure shell connection. Other than that, you know, none of Sharknet servers are allowing any connection from the user side using different type of uh, protocol. So you have to connect, let's say, as you see, I use the SSH and user ID, Isaac, at sharknet, um, sharknet.ca. Uh, when we had a saw machine, I actually made this one. Once you type this kind of way, and you can connect to the Sharknet. Then, where should I punch this kind of line? Well, there are two different ways. If you're using the Macintosh or Linux, you just need to open a terminal. I'm going to show you later. You just need to open a terminal and just type SSH and space user ID at certain uh, server location uh, as a URL. But if you if you're Windows users, you need to have a certain tool to connect it. Therefore, as I mentioned here, you may want to use PuTTY or Toba X term. That's SSH client software, or you can simply Google with the SSH client software. There are many different free versions of software, so you can download it. And then following the instruction of each package, you can successfully connect to our systems. So again, if you're Windows users, you have to have SSH client, which is PuTTY or mobile extension, something like that. If you're Windows, um, Macintosh or Linux users, you just need to open a terminal and just type SSH user ID at our system name as well. And then they will ask you what's your password, and you have to punch in what is the, um, your login credential. And then once it's matched, then you will get into the system without any problem. And then once you log in to the server, especially in Sharknet, you can have a welcome message. And then uh, you can see what system you log in. And then once you want to, once you, you're done you, with your job and you want to get out of there, you simply type exit and you can get out. Otherwise, your term, 
once your terminal is alive, there is a some point or uh, you know someone probably getting into your account and do your job as well. So make sure you get out of the terminal by typing exit command. Um, this is typical command prompt. Uh, you can see we're going to write down command and flag and argument. So as you see, I wrote list ls is command. List my file, minus l, minus a, those kind of things are kind of option. I want to uh, have a different type of list up. Uh, and then there is a directory name or certain file name as well. In Linux system, files and directories, they are basically uh, treated as the same thing. So if you need any help for this command line like that, and then you can use man or info. So like as I showed you in a short version, you may want to type this way, ls space and dash dash help. It will show you a brief version of how to use that command line quickly. And also you can do man space ls will give you man, we call man page. You will get the manual page by calling man space command line, those kind of uh, way. So you can see how to use those kind of uh, command line in this uh, terminal. Now I need to briefly explain what you shall. Uh, once you log into the system, let me go back a couple of slides here. Okay, here. Uh, once you log into the server, as you see, I log on to the saw machine by punching my ID and password, and then you will get cursor. You say this is cursor, so or prompt. Once you log into the uh, Linux machines, if you do have this kind of cursor in a command line, they are waiting for your command. So your commander. So you have to show. Uh, you have to tell what you want to do, right? At that time, as I mentioned, you can get some help how to use that. Uh, the cursor actually we call that a shell. Uh, shell is basically kind of a user interface between the system and the user. So shell can be seen as uh, one more time user interface as a command line environment, okay? Like uh, if you log on to the Mac or Windows machines, right? You can definitely see there are a lot of icons in your desktop and then they're, they're not doing anything, right? So you have to move your mouse cursor and then you have to double click or you have to do something using your mouse to uh, make something happen in your computer, right? That's the same thing here it's going to happen in the shell. But this time, the little bit difficult point is you have to know what you have to do, and then you have to punch in by text. That's the different thing from the Windows or Mac. Because in Windows or Mac in GUI in interface, you just need to move your mouse pointer and then just double click it. But this time, you have to type it by yourself, everything. At that time, shell is the user interface between system and you. Therefore, the shell will try to understand your command. Therefore, shell can be seen as interpreter because computer never understand what's going on when you say echo shell here. Because computer only understands zero and one, as you know, right? So. Before going to that level, shell actually trying to understand what's the user input here. And then once they actually figure out what's the input of the users, they actually successfully change this echo shell kind of human language into the computer language and transfer that information to the computer. Then computer will try to you know, act something based on the command that they got from the shell. And then you can see the screen as, okay, I'll give you the answer. This is the answer. So shell is one more time. Shell is the interface between end user and the system. Uh, there are a number of different types of shells as well. 
um, in Linux system, most likely we're using Bash shell, which is a born again shell. Um, it, we have a C shell, TC shell, coin shell. There are many different types of shell uh, because, as I mentioned, this kind of Linux system originated from the Unix system. Each vendor has their own Unix system, and they do have their own type of shells too. So it, we have some history about this kind of shell. Therefore, there are a number of different types of shells available in the world. But in these days, most likely people are actually using born again shell only. Uh, as I mentioned, the file system basics. Um, so basically, Linux system using this hierarchical file system structure. Um, the top mounting point or top kind of level of file system is root. And on the root, we have these different USR, ETC, home, and work, and scratch. We have this number of different type of uh, directories. And under that directory, we have many different directories as well. Like, for example, home directory, we have a number of user directories, especially in Sharknet machines. As I mentioned, the Sharknet actually supports Canadian research uh, supercomputing. So we have more than uh, 10,000 users right now. So some system has more than like 10,000 directories uh, as under user name. Each directory actually under certain thing. And then as I mentioned, root is the highest kind of amount point you can go up. So some system files are not accessible by users but most of uh, directories are accessible by users as well. Now, some people call this one as uh, nested uh, directories kind of because, for example, this directory A at the end of the point here, directory A is under root, under home, under Isaac, on, and then there is a point, right? So there is a, some levels of directories and then some people call this one as a nested uh, directories. Uh, let me skip this one because Graham has a slightly different file system. Uh, module. Uh, module is very important. I'll cover up this one later. I'm sure most of the people learn about the module in our New Year seminar. Uh, module is basically a software environment. OK. Um, oh, this doubled. OK. All right, here are some useful commands. ls, you can remember this one as a list. When you type ls, it's going to show you what's the contents in that directory. But you have to know where you are, right? And then you can check it out. A, PDW, a PWD, a print working directory or a present working directory, there are many different similar names. But anyway, when, once you type a PWD, it will show you what's the kind of the directory you are in. And CD, change directory. Once you want to change your directory, you have to use CD. And there is MKDIR, make a directory, and RMDIR, uh, remove directory. But you can still use RM only. Because as I mentioned, in Linux system, files and directories are not that different. Uh, for the files, uh, RM, as you see here, and CP, copy, move. I'm going to show this one using the terminal. That's why I'm briefly giving you some introduction about uh, what kind of command line you may uh, expect to see. Uh, diff, oh, this is important. A diff is kind of the command actually comparing two files or more. So as you see in the example, diff a txt and a1 txt, that means we're going to compare it. I'm going to show you how to check it out later. But then the diff will give you the idea what's been changed. So many people are not using Git or SV and those kind of version control. So diff is kind of a naive approach to check out what's the different version between uh, two files or three files or more. And also there is a find, because as I explained, the file system in Linux is nested, which means you sometimes don't know where your file is located, and then you have to find it, right? So find is very, very another useful command as well. So this is my Mac computer, Macintosh. So I just simply did 
terminal. Terminal is located in your application and utilities, or you can do this. Us, what is that? Now you can definitely do the spotlight search as well. Terminal, and then I'll do SSH. Isaac, and Orca the shark at the CA. Orca is our legacy system, and Graham is our newest system. And Orca still using our shark uh, credential, but for the Graham, you have to use Compute Canada credentials. It's just slightly different. Anyway, uh, if you if you are Windows users, you should have this kind of uh, environment um, downloading mobile apps or or um, what is the PuTTY those kind of things. If I punch that, it's going to ask me what's the password. If you can successfully punch in, you're in. So if I type PWD, it will show you where I am. Okay. If I go to the root CD, change your directory to the root, and then if I list up, there are multiple directory points actually here. As you see, there are some directory names work, right? And some directory names home, and some directory names project something blah 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 and TMP many different kind of things if you do ls minus l you can definitely see there are many different uh, directories with more information as you see if I say for example first line B well you can guess the date and the year easily and it looks like this is kind of size, but this is directory, so it has slightly different information than the size. But these two things, root, root means who is the owner and who is the group of the owner. So the first kind of letters are sometimes wonder you have some question. And then D means the directory. Okay. L is the link, those kind of way. Uh, however, as you see, there are three letters actually combined. It looks like we have R-X, 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 right? So if you look at another one, there is a R-W-X, right? We call this as permission. So first three is about you, and second three is about your group, and last three is about others. So technically speaking, if I try to understand the first line, R is a read, and there is no kind of power about the writing, okay? And X is executing when you run your job, uh, run your code. Uh, you can execute it. So owner has this kind of pro uh, permission, and my group has the same permission, and others actually have the same permission, okay? Therefore, we can move on to there because I'm I'm kind of other because I'm not belongs to this owner name or I'm not I don't belong to this group name but I can still go to him because I'm other but as I mentioned the permission actually allowed for the others read only and executable only executable means in this case you can move in or change into that directory um, so you can see that way that's the permission how to change that? Yeah, you can probably take a look at it in our help week a little bit more about the details. Anyway, let me move that. Um, you may want to have some chip key, uh, CD and uh, tilde, which is right beside the keyboard number one, and then enter. It will move you to the directory. Or sometimes you're in the root. How can I check it out? Present working directory. Where I am? Okay. I am in the root, the highest kind of mounting point. Can I go to my home directory? Yes, you can do CD and just enter. Okay, so these two things, CD enter or CD tilde is basically the same thing. And if you do PWD, you will get a home directory. Okay, I want to move to the work directory, which is under work and Isaac. I want to list up. I have quite many files there. 
right? And now I want to move to the MPI test as well. And then list up. So I want to change my hello.c. At the time, you, will, you want to open the text editor. Uh, you can use a VI. I'm kind of VI person, but these days, Nano is a fairly fantastic tool. Nano, that's, uh, nano space hello.c. Enter. Then you will open hello.c using the Nano, that's a software, Nano uh, program. And you can see what is the kind of the inside of the hello.c. Okay. I'll change one word here. Like, um, let's say hello. Well, instead of word, I'll change hello Canada. And then I'll try to save that. As you may see in the bottom of the screen, there are some options you can use. But this head means always uh, control. So control G, control X, control O, those kind of things. So if I do control X, it will ask you to write down. Save, modify, yes. Name the file. I'll change the file name. Hello to the C. Yes. So if I list up, I do have a hello C. If I say cat, hello C. Cat is another command. If you don't know how to use that, you can use help, right? Cat help. So you can get some help about the cat. Or sometimes man cat. If, you, if it does have a man page, it will show you how to use cat command. So if I say cat hello to let's see you can definitely there is Canada I punched in and then as I mentioned you sometimes want to compare two different files in the Linux system right let's say diff hello dot C and hello dot hello to two dot C okay and then enter it it will show you where is it different the comparing line 17 and line 17, okay, there is a character difference. Word and Canada, they are different. So diff is quite useful uh, command as well. Again, if you don't know how to use diff, you can use dash dash help or or man help uh, man diff. You can see how to use this kind of diff command there. There are many things you can do here, but let me explain a couple of things more here. So if I move ssh org db2, because this kind of system you log in already right now is a login node. So login node mainly proposed for you know changing your source code a little bit and compile lightly. I just want to move myself to my our uh, development node in our Orca system. You can do this way, and there are a couple of things I want to do about the process. If you punch W and enter, it will show you who is actually in this system and what they're doing. So as you see, my name is here, Isaac, using the terminal to and then Oracle login node, login, and blah, 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 right? Sometimes you want to see how much the CPU actually is working on by using top command, T-O-P. So you can see what program or who is using the CPU more or how much? So virtual memory, and then you can see here is the CPU percentage, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean all the system actually occupy this uh, user, because Orca has Orca development node has multiple core, so 
100% means one of the CPU actually is occupied by that job. So there is command, how much time it's been used. And you can use Q to quit from that. Okay. Sometimes you want to do another way, PS minus X. PS means process and minus X, enter it you will see what kind of command or ps minus ax. a means everything. So x is kind of extensive extensive information. You can see so many process actually working on here and there for something, something. And if I go up. Yeah. You can see process ID. This is process ID. So sometimes you want to kill a certain job, right? And sometimes you want to, you know, uh, stop those kind of things. So let me make some process and then I'll kill it. Let's say If I run, um, let's say simply a dot out, uh, it's not long enough. Mm. Yeah, you can simply kill the process, let's say ps, and if you want to kill this process, then you simply do kill minus nine and forty eighty eight, and then it's gonna kill the process and get out. That's why I personally kicked out by myself. As you see, the system has been changed because this process or shell is the process I made when I log into the development node and I have authority to open it and kill it because I'm the user, right? So I, once I kill that process using the kill and minus sign and process ID, then that bash shell I opened it when I log in was killed. Therefore, automatically I was kicked out of the system. Okay, so p kill minus nine. Well, there are a bunch of different options for kill as well. Uh, so, so you can check it out this way. Well. Oh, sorry. You can do. You can read this kind of um, manual how to use kill command properly. Uh, but that's good kind of to know how when you need to kill your process. And the other thing I want to briefly mention is, is your environmental checkup. Um, let's, let me move here. When you log into this kind of lo, uh, um, sharpness, I'm sorry, Linux system, there is an automatic kind of process or automatic kind of a procedure the system actually are doing when you log in. That is actually, you can check it out, minus A. There are a couple of hidden files. This starting with a dot is always hidden in the Linux system. And there is a bash RC. This is the file automatically uh, kind of loaded. So if I check my BSGRC, this is the kind of process actually when you log in, the computer actually goes through this kind of lines one by one. So use your specific analysis functions and they'll go to the ETC and BSGRC and they'll check it out. Okay, And then otherwise they're going to read it. And there is some command line. This is I set up. You may have different one. And I set up this kind of alias. Alias is kind of short form for certain command. And then there is uh, some options for the terminal and the history size. That's what I said. Actually, it will be read it every single time. So I actually made uh, some alias for the module load and module unload, those kind of things, because I'm too lazy to use module load every single time. So when I said alias, it's, it's going to show me all the alias I have right now. So I can definitely have them. You can make more kind of lines if you want. 
So those kind of things we call environmental variables. So those kind of things will be set as you, your kind of working environment. And once you log in, this all the information is automatically up. So when you type it simply EMB, it will show you all the environmental setup for you. You probably didn't know how much actually setup actually done for you. As I showed you, here we go. Okay, starting here, EMB, right? So, in, uh, Mescono library, root, LD flag, man path, host name, you know, uh, PBS is actually batch scheduler for job. Anyway, um, some Intel license file because you're going to have Intel compile as a default and terminal setup and what's the shell you're going to use and what's the history size I set up, right? In our dot bash on C and CPP flag and then what's the client I have. All the information actually is set here as you see. And what's the kind of F90 is I for? Many things, many things already set up. And on top of that, Sharknet actually using the module system, which means if you do the module list, you can definitely see there are automatically loaded um, your modules as well. Which means when you type, let's say, simply, um, let's say, MPI CC. Right? So MPICC doesn't give you any clue it's related with Intel, right? But it's related with Intel because it has ICPC. Because your module actually loaded for the Intel machines. So this environmental setup plus module system is the working condition you have. So when you need to change that, you have to change it properly. Or sometimes you have to make sure what, what kind of environmental setup you have right now to do your job in our shockness systems. So I'll stop here and I'll get some questions if you have. Thank you.